for the Word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even the dividing of soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Well, good morning, Brookside. Welcome. It's good to be with you all today. My name is Brad. I'm the campus pastor at Elkhorn. And i um, so glad that you're joining us from all the ways and locations that you are. I want to say welcome to Elkhorn. Shout out to you all today. I miss you all. Welcome to all of you here at Millard, right here in the room. Great to be with you. I want to say welcome to all of the mods at our Correctional Center campus and all of you that are watching online from wherever you're watching from. Um, it's good to be together today. Always a pleasure for me to be joining you. And um, as you just saw and heard in that intro, we're in the middle of our summer series called Living and Active, where each week one of our teaching pastors is sharing a scripture passage or a topic that has helped God's word come alive to them. We never want God's word to become dull or dry or boring. And so it's, since it's God's very word, since it really is living and active, Hebrews 4.12, um, we, wanna, we want it to speak to us. We want to come hungry to the Bible. We want it to shape us. It's an ancient text, and yet, boy, it is so relevant today. And so we want to be eager to hear what God has to say to us. So I'm excited to dive in today. Today, I want to start with just a simple question. Have you ever found the Bible to be difficult to understand? Along these lines of, yes, it's, it's living and active, but have you ever found it to be difficult to understand? Or to put it another way, have you ever wondered... How does this book flow together? There's lots of stories in the Bible, but how does it all flow together? What's maybe the main story? What's, what unifies all of Scripture? If you're like me, whether you've been a Christian for a short time or a long time, you might sometimes feel like, I know I'm supposed to read the Bible, and I know I'm supposed to obey the Bible, but sometimes, honestly, this book is really, really challenging. Sometimes it's overwhelming, uh, maybe particularly in the Old Testament, right? I just maybe don't understand what I'm reading. At times it's intimidating. Sometimes we, we maybe just feel like, this is good, this is important, but I'm just not quite sure how this affects my life now, today. What am I supposed to do with this? And as I said, in particular, the Old Testament is challenging. I was just speaking to a friend a couple weeks ago, and he said, Brad, I'm just starting to engage the Bible, and I love reading it. But he said, the Old Testament especially, like I almost can't read the Old Testament. I just don't understand how to engage the Old Testament. What parts still apply today and which parts don't? What's with some of the weird ceremonial laws, especially in Leviticus, right, or other parts of the Old Testament? Um, and even, why does God seem a little more temperamental in the Old Testament, maybe a little more angry than in the New? What's going on there? And so I want to give us a starting point today. I'm not going to answer all of your questions about the Bible. There's not time for that. But I want to give you a foundation and a framework for how to approach the whole Bible. And this morning, I want you to see how Jesus himself approaches Scripture. So we're going to be studying Luke chapter 24, verses 13 through 35. If you have a Bible, you can turn there now or put a finger there. Luke 24, 13 through 35, last chapter in Luke. This is one of my favorite passages in all of Scripture. And in fact, many of you, if you are tracking along with our 365 Bible reading plan, that's maybe not all of you, but if you're reading that, you read this passage this last Wednesday. We finished up Luke. We're starting to get into Acts. And so without any, even knowing it, I hope maybe that chapter was intriguing to you if you read that on Wednesday. But here's the scoop. Primarily today, I want to focus in on one key takeaway that we find in the middle of this passage. I first learned what we're talking about today 12 or 13 years ago. It was 2010 or 2011. I had already been a youth pastor here at Brookside for four to five years or so. I was transitioning at the time from our middle school pastor to a high school pastor position. I had a Bible college degree, and yet I had never heard or been taught how to understand this overall overarching storyline of the Bible and particularly the Old Testament in this way, this sort of cohesive, unified story. And so when I learned this, it completely changed how I viewed and interpreted the Bible. And it was life-giving to me. It brought the Bible to life. It was new to me, but it wasn't new. But as I said, it brought me more excitement and more passion and more clarity when it came to the Bible than ever before. 
Why is that? Well, I'd say it's because I saw for the very first time how the whole Bible flowed together. I saw how it told one unified story. And it was a true story, of course, but it told a really great true story. If I were to summarize this in, in a phrase, this would be it. This, would, this is my big idea for today. If you're taking notes, maybe you can jot this down in the period of time that's on the screen. The Bible is one book that presents the unfolding true story of God's plan to redeem the whole world through his son, Jesus. The Bible is one book that presents the unfolding true story of God's plan to redeem the world through his son, Jesus. For us as Christians, this is the story we live by, this one overarching story of the Bible, and this is absolutely essential, I think, for a life of discipleship to Jesus. We have this core value at Brookside called biblical authority, and as we follow where the Bible points, we discover that the Bible is centered on Jesus. It's all about Jesus from beginning to end. That's what we're going to see today from Luke 24. So I'm excited to dive into this. Again, if you have a Bible or an app, would you turn there, click there? I'd love for you to follow along, even though the text will be on the screens this morning. And so I'm going to read this story with some, uh, some comments kind of sprinkled in. And, um, and then I just want to draw out a few basic principles as we think this morning on what it means to live by the one true story of the Bible. So verse 13 says, Luke writes this, now that same day, and I'm going to cut us off right away, now that same day, what day is it? Actually, if you look back at verse 1, you find this is the very first Easter Sunday. This is Resurrection Sunday. This is later on in the day, but the Lord, you know, the they, women went to the tomb early in the morning, first couple of verses, it's that day, so a big day, right? So that same day, two of them, who are these people, who are these guys, we'll, we'll see in a moment that they were disciples of Jesus. Um, they're going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. Now, we're not quite sure why they were going to Emmaus. This may have been home for one or both of these guys. Um, they may have been in Jerusalem just for the Passover. But as we'll see in a moment, as we get into the story, it's obvious that they are a part of the group of disciples. They're a part of that, that group. And so we're not quite sure what's happening, um, but this is seven miles, they might be going home. Whatever the case, because Jesus, as you'll see, they thought he was the Messiah, but he was, he was crucified, he died, he was buried, and everything changed. And they thought, let's get out of Dodge. Like, let's go back, I don't know if it's home, but we're walking back to Emmaus. So verse 14, they were talking with each other about everything that had happened. Meaning, again, this whole crazy week before, right, Jesus is arrested, and then he's crucified. The events of the supposed resurrection as we'll get into, or the missing body of Jesus. Verse 15, as they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. Now, I think this means that Jesus supernaturally kept these guys from recognizing, recognizing him. I don't think it's just that Jesus was wearing the Jedi cloak with a large hood, and they just never really got a glimpse of Jesus' face. I don't think that was the case. I think Jesus sort of kept them, somehow they were kept from recognizing him. So verse 17, he asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? This is hilarious to me, right? Jesus is playing ignorant stranger. What are you talking about? What are you discussing together? And then it says they stood still, their faces downcast. So I love this. They're walking, they're walking, verse 15, Jesus came, comes up and walks alongside him. And Jesus says, hey, what are you guys talking about? And they stop walking. They stand still, right? They're like, what a question is that? What kind of question is that? One of them named Cleopas asked him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened here in these days? Cleopas is like, what are you, living in a cave? Are you a tourist? What do you mean? What, th like, what is going on? What, like, you haven't heard about this? What things? Verse 19, about Jesus of Nazareth, they replied, Again, the irony here, the fact that they are kept from knowing this is Jesus. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. Now, again, I would like to think that a week before this, these two guys would have said, he's the Messiah. That's who Jesus is. He's the son of God. But these events take place. Jesus is arrested. He's crucified. He dies. And so what they say is he was a prophet. He was powerful in word and deed, but he was just a prophet 
The chief priests, verse 20, and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped. Again, notice that past tense, right? We had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. And so again, time out for a second. Through all of this, these guys are obviously, they're perplexed, they're puzzled, they're, they're downcast, they're depressed. It does not seem, there's no indication given that they believe that Jesus is alive. There's, these, there's reports, but no one has seen Jesus yet. And so they're downcast. Verse 25, he said to them, how foolish you are. And how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And so Jesus, again, is a stranger to these guys, but kind of rebukes them, sort of sets them straight. What would it have been like to be there with them? What was going through the minds of these guys when this stranger schools them with a Bible study lesson? In verse 27, and beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going further. But they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. Breaks bread, hands it out. They're like, oh, Jesus. And he, he vanishes, like you do. Verse 32, they asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he, while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. Just got there seven miles there, two and a half, three hour walk, seven miles back. Still resurrection Sunday, right? It's getting late. There they found the eleven. And those with them assembled together and saying, it is true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. And then the two told what had happened, what happened on the way, and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. Wow. Right? Like, what would it have been like to have been with these two guys? This is an incredible story. What an exciting Easter Sunday for these disciples. Can you imagine the flurry of emotion, especially once he reveals himself, and they're thinking back to everything he talked about, their hearts are burning. When they realize the truth of what Jesus taught them and showed them. And so our, our, my prayer is that that may be true even of us today as we study this. And so what I want to do is draw out just a few very simple principles based on this teaching this morning. And the first one is this. The Bible is one story. The Bible is one story. Look with me again at verses 25 through 27. Of course, this is really the climax of the passage. He said to them, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. So Jesus walks them through the Old Testament. And of course, when he says with Moses, he's referring to the Torah, right? The first five books of the Bible that Moses wrote. And when he says all the prophets, that would have meant just that, really sort of the rest of the Hebrew scriptures, and certainly all the prophets, the major prophets, the minor prophets, Isaiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Malachi, Hosea, all of them. Moses and the prophets is really, it was a common summary for the Hebrew scriptures in that day and age. You'll see that in other parts of Acts and in other parts of the New Testament. And so he's walking through the story, connecting the dots, showing them how it all fits together, showing that it's one plot line moving towards resolution. Let me just spell out a few simple things related to this this morning. You probably know the answer to some of these, but what's the problem throughout the entire story of the Bible? What's the problem? The problem is sin, in a word. The problem is sin. What's the resolution to the story of the Bible. Well, I would put it like this, that the, the resolution is the life, death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus Christ. Or you might just say, Jesus Christ. What's the resolution? Jesus is the resolution. What's the thread? What's the primary theme that runs throughout all of the Bible? 
And again, in a word, I would say redemption is a great word. That's the thread throughout the entire Bible. Redemption is what weaves it all together. Again, this is such a different way of understanding the Bible than what I remember being taught growing up. When I was growing up, I saw the Bible only as a book of rules to keep and examples to follow. The Bible was a book of rules to keep. So it was like, there's always lists, right? Do these things and don't do these things. And in Sunday school, there was kind of plenty of that. And sometimes in the New Testament, we find those things. But you need to do the good things and don't do the bad things, right? And if you don't do the good things or you do do the bad things, then God and your parents are going to be upset with you and you won't get the things you want or you'll get punished. But that was sort of it, right? I mean, some of us maybe are like, is that really not the point? I thought that was the point of the Bible. Do this, don't do this, that's about it. Or I saw the Bible as a set of examples to follow by means of all the biblical stories. So you learn about the story of David and Goliath, perhaps the most popular, right? And the moral of the story is go out and be like David. Have the courage of David and you can do it. And you know what? Here's why you can do it. David took five stones out of the river, you know, and he was going to fight Goliath. And you can take five stones. And those five stones are faith and courage and strength and perseverance and grit or whatever they are. That's, the, that, that's Sunday school lesson, right? And actually, you only need one stone because it only took David one stone to kill Goliath. And that stone is faith. The end. It's like class dismissed. Go and be like David. Be like Joseph who ran from Potiphar's wife. Be like Noah, who obeyed God's call to build an ark. Don't be like Noah, by the way, after the events of the ark. We don't teach that story in Sunday school. But beforehand, be like Noah. Be like Esther, who used her power in the palace to save God's people from destruction. Be like Jonah, but again, only after he repented and was swallowed by a great fish. The Bible is a book of rules to keep and a set of examples to follow. That's what I remember growing up. Now, again, it may have been taught to me differently. And of course, that's not all bad, right? It is good to follow the rules of the Bible. And there certainly are traits of characters in the Bible that are worth emulating. But the problem comes when we believe that the main thrust of the Bible and the overarching storyline is do more and try harder to impress God. One author puts it this way, He says, the Bible isn't primarily good advice telling you what you should and shouldn't do. Now, of course, there's advice in the Bible, but that's not the main thing. The Bible is primarily good news about what God has already done for you. Now, when I say the Bible is one story, what is that one story? If someone put you on the spot today and said, you're a Christian, tell me, what is the overarching storyline of the Bible? Could you answer that question? Again, most of us know at least one or two of the stories in the Bible. Plenty of us could list off 10, maybe more than 10, right? We've we've learned all of those. But when I say the Bible is one story, what do I mean? Well, here's a common four-point or four-plot movement uh, storyline of the Bible. Plenty of you are probably familiar with this. But it looks like this creation, fall, redemption, and new creation. Right? Creation, Genesis 1 and 2. Just two chapters, you know, the the account of the creation. The fall happens in Genesis chapter 3. From there, that third one, redemption, really does. That's a great, again, a great theme for really a bulk of the Bible. Genesis 4, really all the way to like uh, Revelation 20. Just this whole, I've said before, and I used to teach, you know, our students, the whole Old Testament is like building this grand tension that just really doesn't get resolved until Jesus comes. We need a king, and we can't obey, and we, we, we do obey, and then we sin, and we get thrown into exile, and we repent, and sort of this, the Israelites, just this loop over and over again. Redemption, and the new creation, finally one day, you know, accounted Revelation 21, 22, the new heavens and the new earth. We're sort of in that overlap of the already and the not yet of the kingdom right now, but one day, sin will be completely eradicated. You can use other language. There's lots of covenants in the Bible, and I won't get into that today, but maybe you've heard that before. It's as simple as it sounds. Those are the major turning points in Scripture. That's one way to understand the big picture story of the Bible. And so the Bible is a story, but what we're seeing specifically in Luke 24 is that that's the story about Jesus. 
my second principle is just that. The Bible is one story about Jesus. So look with me again at verse 27. I already dive into this a little. But beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. So Jesus is walking them through the Old Testament, essentially saying, that's about me, and that's about me, and this is telling you this, this part of who I am, and um, this is telling you this about me. Again, I can only imagine what this talk, sermon, explanation would have been like. He probably would have started with Genesis 3 and said, I'm the seed of the woman who will crush the head of the serpent, but who will be bruised in the process. He probably would have gone to Genesis chapter 12 and said, I'm the descendant of Abraham who will bring God's blessings to all the families of the earth. He probably would have gone to Exodus 12 and said, I'm the lamb that's been slain, whose blood covers over your sins and spares you from the judgment of God. He probably would have gone to 2 Samuel 7 and said, I'm the descendant of David who will reign on his throne, not just over Israel, but over all creation. He probably would have gone to Isaiah 53 and said, I'm the suffering servant who died to ransom God's people from sin. And he probably would have gone to Jeremiah 31 and said, I'm the one who made a new covenant with God's people and said, I will forgive your wickedness and remember your sins no more. Every story, every figure, every event, Jesus says, is pointing ultimately to himself. What Jesus says here to these disciples He says in a more direct way and in a more confrontational way to the Pharisees in the book of John chapter 5. Now, the Pharisees were the religious PhDs of the day. They were very impressive religiously from everyone's perspective. But Jesus got in their face. And one of the ways he did that was in the way that they understood Scripture. Because the Pharisees loved Scripture. They memorized Scripture, right? They memorized whole books of the Bible. They were obsessed with the Scriptures. The Pharisees, some of them would have these phylacteries that they would put on their foreheads or their wrists that they would carry, little tiny scrolls of scripture that they would put in there. And yet they missed the key point. And so Jesus says this in John 5, verses 39 and 40. Again, I love these verses. He says, you study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. These are the very scriptures that testify about me, yet you refuse to come to me to have life. Jesus says, it's great that you know the scriptures so well, but you miss the one to whom the scriptures point. In other words, the scriptures are not an end in and of themselves. They're meant to point us to Christ. The written word is meant to point us to the incarnate word, the Lord Jesus. As I said, I I learned this way of understanding the Bible quite a few years ago. And I was so thankful that I did. It was largely thanks uh, to the ministry of Tim Keller, an author and pastor in New York City. At least he, he sort of popularized it, I feel like, in these past couple decades. Keller sadly passed away just a few months ago, was battling pancreatic cancer, I believe. But Keller wrote this fantastic synopsis of Jesus as the true and better, the, the fulfillment of all of these Old Testament characters and stories and symbols. And again, this was so eye-opening and so powerful for me to be able to understand this overarching, this, this like, how, the, how all the scripture weaves, weaves together as one unified story. And so I'm going to show you this video today that takes what Keller wrote. So he penned basically verbatim what's in this video and put some animation to it. This is absolutely beautiful. So check this out. The Bible is not a series of disconnected stories. It is a single narrative in which every story, every character points beyond itself to one who is greater. The story of Adam and Eve is not just about the first man and woman. There is a true and better Adam who passed the test in the garden and whose obedience is ascribed to us. There is a true and better Abel who, though innocently slain, has blood that cries out not for our condemnation, but for our acquittal. There is a true and better Abraham who answered the call of God to leave all the comfortable and familiar and go out into the void to create a new people of God. There is a true and better Isaac 
the son of laughter, of grace, who was not just offered up by his father on the mount, but was truly sacrificed for us all. There is a true and better Jacob who wrestled and took the blow of justice we deserve. So we, like Jacob, only receive the wounds of grace that wake us up and discipline us. There is a true and better Joseph who at the right hand of the king forgives those who betrayed and sold him and uses his new power to save them. There is a true and better Moses who stands in the gap between the people and the Lord and who mediates a new covenant. There is a true and better rock of Moses who struck with the rod of God's justice now gives us water in the desert. There is a true and better Job, the truly innocent sufferer, who then intercedes for and saves his foolish friends. There is a true and better David, whose victory becomes his people's victory, though they never lifted a stone to accomplish it themselves. There is a true and better Esther, who didn't just risk losing an earthly palace, but lost the ultimate heavenly one, who didn't just risk his life, but gave his life to save his people. There is a true and better Jonah who was cast out into the storm so that we could be brought in. There is a true and better Passover lamb, innocent, perfect, helpless, slain so the angel of death will pass over us. He's the true temple, the true prophet, the true priest, the true king, the true sacrifice, the true lamb, the true light, and the true bread. The Bible is not a series of disconnected stories. It is a single narrative that points to one person, Jesus. I love it. Every time I watch that, I worship. I love it. So we learn that the Bible is a story about Jesus. And what that does mean is that the Bible is not ultimately about you or about me. In other words, if Jesus is the hero, then you're not the hero, and I'm not the hero. Now, that doesn't sound very uplifting, but let me explain why that's not bad news. And again, I'm not saying that God doesn't know you inside and out and love you tremendously and extravagantly. But what this teaches us is the Bible's for you, but it's not about you and me. And again, here's why it's not bad news that Jesus, not you, is the hero of the story. Because you were created by God for something great. You were created by God to be a part of something bigger than yourself. You were made to be a part of a God-sized mission. And so when you settle for focusing on yourself and making it all about you, it's only, it only leads to disappointment and frustration. And again, what I mean by that is when we approach the Bible as if it's just a religious book or a book of quotations or I'm just going to pull this out and, and apply some advice to my life because it's all about me, we miss it. And so if you make life all about you, you will find that you're constantly dissatisfied because you were made for something bigger than yourself. So when we learn that Jesus, not we, are the hero, we can find peace and rest and satisfaction in him. We can be freed from constantly clamoring to be the king of the hill in our own lives. And so I hope that that's freeing even today. So we've said that the scriptures point to Jesus we also have to notice in this passage how Jesus points to the scriptures. I mean, just think about this for a second. How does Jesus reveal himself to these disciples? Like, how does he do it? He's the resurrected Christ. Like, that morning, this is sort of his first, at least the way Luke uh, records it, his first time on camera, so to speak. The women only see the angels, but Jesus, this is the first time he shows up. He's the resurrected Christ. He could have radiated all of his glory before these two guys. He could have called in a million angels to sing a chorus of who he is as the son of God. He could have performed all the miracles all over again, right? He could have multiplied loaves and walked on water. He could have called in lightning and thunder. I mean, he could have put on a show. But what does he do? He walks through the scriptures with these guys. He gives them a sermon, and then he accepts their invitation, and he sits down with them and breaks bread with them. Isn't that fascinating? He could have done all kinds of things. He's the risen Savior, but instead he reveals himself, and yet, and yet in such a simple yet profound way. And he says, let me show you who I am from God's 
written word, the revelation of God. And then let's sit down together and break bread. That's the kind of God that he is. What an incredibly powerful thing to think about. And so the Bible is one story, and the Bible is one story about Jesus. So let's get really practical here for a bit as we wrap up. Again, <clears throat> my application today is not overly flashy, but first I want to mention this. I want to go quickly back to something I mentioned at the beginning, that for too many of us, we feel intimidated, perhaps, for some of us when it comes to the Bible. And many people also feel guilty that they don't read the Bible enough. I'm sure that some of you may have had those feelings from time to time, especially at church. I know I have over the years. And so let me say this about the intimidation factor. It's okay to be intimidated by the Bible. It's a really big book. 66 books, a lot to understand, a lot that you just are like, if you're newer to faith, if you're newer uh, to church, whatever, if you've never really studied the Bible much, it's a really big book written in three different languages over a period of 1,500 years and written a long, long time ago, right? So there's a huge cultural gap between the world of the Old Testament and the world of the New Testament and the world of 21st century America today. So it's okay if you're reading through the Bible and you come to some part of it and you go, I don't understand what that means. That's okay. And it's something that we learn over a lifetime as we engage the Bible over weeks and months and years and decades. And so we, we come to this even from perhaps a whole lifetime of following Jesus. And some of you, maybe you're younger hearing me, and maybe you're relatively new to the Bible. But so that's the first thing. Keep, we can keep learning from the Bible. I do love the fact that in a lifetime, we'll never plumb the depths of this book. Like, that's why it's living and active. It's fantastic. But so also, don't, keep, don't give up on it. Like, if that's you and you're intimidated by it, keep going. And then in terms of the guilt factor... And I think this is really important to talk about because guilt is a powerful motivator, but it's also a terrible and an unhealthy motivator. And there are honestly a lot of people who read the, their Bibles being motivated by guilt. We often think this is something I have to do as a Christian. Again, it's one of those rules, right? You got to do this and you can't do this. And so we tend to think if I don't read my Bible regularly, then I'm a bad Christian and I don't know, God's going to punish me or bad things are going to happen to me. Listen, I don't want you to read the Bible out of guilt. You should read the Bible driven by love and driven by trust, that you trust that God has something good for you. Because the Lord has broken the silence. He's initiated relationship with you. He wants to speak to you, and he speaks to us first and foremost by his word. This is how he does it. He reveals himself to us in, script, in, in the Bible, in Scripture. And so we get to read the word of God. So it might not always be fun and easy, but I will say sometimes it's fun and it's relatively easy, and sometimes it's life-giving. And again, you read something that day and it's very easy to understand, and it carries you on that day or maybe even for that week. But so I would encourage you to establish a practice of reading the Bible every day, whether you feel like it or not. And again, as you develop a relationship with your Heavenly Father, Scripture is God speaking to you. He wants to speak to you. Again, be motivated by love and trust. Listen to God when he says, or we know God says, this is, this is good for you. He says, I want this for you. God says, I need this as much as I need bread today. So I'm going to do it. And I'm going to, if I don't understand it, I'm going to find other resources. Or I'm going to ask a friend or a pastor. Or I'm going to seek out help. But I'm going to walk in faithfulness because he has been so faithful to me. And so practically what I want to ask you to do today it's just simply this, be a student of God's word. We, we talk about this almost every Sunday, right? This was part of Johnny's message two weeks ago. But be a student of God's word, no matter how old or young you are. Keep diving into it. And so two ways to do this. First of all, very, very practically, just make time for it. Have a reading plan or a guide of some kind. We talk a lot about our 365 reading plan. If you don't have any plan, that is a great one to start with. And it's awesome because... As a church, we can like all be in that one plan together. But there's all sorts of reading plans out there. There's other Bible study tools if you wanna dive into the text a little more. But also then set aside a time, and even I might say a place every day, and make that non-negotiable for you. 
not only a time, but even I find that finding a place where you go to meet with the Lord is really awesome. And if this is brand new to you, like start with just five minutes a day. Start small. I'm going to give God five minutes of my day in the morning and work at it from there. But secondly, and perhaps more importantly, um, remember the overarching storyline of, of the Bible. As we, in light of what we talked about today, whenever you read a story or a passage of scripture, yes, first of all, like try to figure out what did the author, what is the author trying to say right here in this book, in this verse, in the context of the Bible, right? That's always very, very important. But secondly, also try to put that individual story or passage into the overall storyline of redemption, of this all points to Jesus. And so I think, again, it's very, very important to do that. We always study the Bible in context, but also see that the whole Bible is a narrative. And it's pointing you toward Jesus. You ask the questions like, how does this passage point me to Jesus? Or how does this passage show show my vital need for redemption? A really great resource that does this so well is there's a a children's Bible out there. It's been around for a while now. It's called the Jesus Storybook Bible. I know plenty of you in this room or that are hearing my voice, you have that Bible at home, especially if you have young kids, if your kids are getting older now. I know Clint and Emily, our kids been directors, give that out as a gift if you dedicate kids. But it's it's just this resource. Again, it's a children's Bible, but like the tagline to it is literally, I think it says, every story whispers his name. And so even if you're a grown adult, if you don't have that, it is a tremendous resource to see this thread of redemption in Jesus that's woven throughout all of Scripture. And so I just want to close with this. When I learned, again, when I learned this way of viewing the Bible as one story, one true story, all pointing to Jesus, it wasn't just some new or flashy way to interpret Scripture, right? We see clearly today that this is how Jesus himself, he said, hey, you guys, all of, all of the Old Testament, this is all really about me. And just growing up, we go, when in the Old Testament does it, does it like, say Jesus? And yet, it turns out, like, this is all pointing toward him. But so to me, it brought the Bible to life all the more. And it made reading the Bible exciting because I was sort of, I was, I could find that deeper meaning of, okay, I understand what this says, but what does this mean in light of the whole storyline of Scripture? This is not just a piece of advice for me. The whole Bible is a story of good news. And so it was absolutely life-giving to me. And so to quote the Jesus Storybook Bible, it says this, the Bible is a love story about a brave prince who leaves his palace, his throne, everything, to rescue the one he loves. It's like the most wonderful of fairy tales that has come true in real life because the best thing about this story is it's true. So today, may our hearts burn each and every time we open up this book as we seek the one who paid it all and the one who came to redeem us, our Lord and Savior. Will you pray with me? Father God, today, I thank you for your word. God, I thank you for this insight. And we're in Luke 24, but Father, I even later in this chapter, Jesus, you are with your disciples again. You, they come back and you show up to all of them. You say this, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. And Luke records, then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. So Father God, today, I pray that you would open our minds. God, that we might see that all the scriptures it's true, but God, it points to you, this one, the story of redemption. God, it's really not about us. And it's not a book of advice or quotations or just religious words. Father, it tells a story of redemption. And Father, it all comes back to you, our Savior and our Redeemer. So God, may we worship you today in light of that. God, we love you. We pray this in Jesus' name.